Now, it's book time now, a truly remarkable story, even by boxing's remarkable standards. A boy who was a pro from 10, often fighting dozens of times each year, fighting 15-round fights against grown men from the tender age of 13, beating British champions when he was 15, and yet finished with a boxing business when he was just 17 after 120 fights. His name was Nipper Daly. His remarkable story has been told in a book by his grandson, Alex Daly. It's called Nipper, the amazing story of boxing's wonder boy. A bit earlier, I spoke to Alex. I started by asking him, was he as amazed as me at the tiny detail and, and the remarkable career of his granddad. Yes, yeah, Steve, I'm, I was amazed. Um, all I knew was I had a famous grandfather who was a uh, you know, pro boxer from the 20s. Uh, I knew he was very successful, but apart from that, uh, I hadn't been told very much about him. Uh, the more I looked into it, the uh, deeper I delved. Um, I just became convinced. I, I uncovered a story that would make uh, a really fascinating book. Um, what he was doing at, at such a young age was, was just incredible, especially looking upon it uh, in modern times uh, from you know a modern perspective. But even in ancient, even in those times, ancient times, you know, as such, you know, 90 years ago, even then there were enough people writing in newspapers and in the trade magazine suggesting it was tricky that this boy of 10, 11, and 12 was fighting 10 rounds, and, and then what at 13 or 14 fighting 15 rounders against men. Yeah, yeah, he was uh, he was topping the bill at places like Premier Land, which was one of the leading venues of the day at age fifteen, uh, age Staggering. fourteen rather. In fifteen um, round fights, just fifteen round fights, yeah, against against guys of sort of nineteen, twenty, early twenties. But it just and, and seemed, beating them as well. I, I know that you've done done the sums on it and looked at how many fights he's done because there's a brilliant piece in the back of the book, sort of saying how many. Uh, bouts he had that year, but I, th I think there's also some of the travelling he did. I uncovered something this morning where he went to, I think, Sunderland, then he went to Blackpool, Preston, Nottingham, back to London, and then back to Liverpool to box in six days. Now, how did they do that in 1928? Well, I, I guess the travelling was done by train, um, but how he managed it physically at such a young age is... Uh, Another question altogether. I mean, it's quite phenomenal that a lad could box 15 rounds up in Sunderland, jump on the train, uh, you know, a couple of days later he's fighting back in London, another 15 rounder. Um, it just uh, beggars belief, really. But uh, I mean, it's all it's all down there in the uh, newspaper reports. Um, it really, really happened. Now, this guy, Professor Andrew Newton, the, the professor, the one and only, as he was often called. Um, the more I'm reading, and, I, and, I, and I'm reading this properly. Uh, which is a compliment to both you and your grandfather. Uh, in a sense, I'm reading this book from cover to cover. I'm not speed reading it like I do with most of the books that land in my pigeonhole at BBC London. I'm on page 209, and I hate this guy, the professor. I want to kill him. Yeah, I want to. I want to. I want to travel back in time and injure this man for what he was doing to your grandfather. I, I, the hate is, and that's great because that's going to help you sell books. Yeah, yeah. He's 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 just. Staggering to believe that you, your grand, your grandfather's parents basically handed him over to this guy who just got him on a basically every single day, either sparring an, an exhibition somewhere where he was being paid from the age of ten, or boxing five, ten, fifteen, or twenty rounds. It's quite staggering. It, it is unbelievable, yeah. Um, and as you say, Professor Newton uh, didn't seem to have any concern for the welfare of the the boxers or you know my grandfather specifically it was, it was all about making money for him as far as i can tell and how much money did they make in the end i mean when your grandfather actually quit and i haven't come to that part of the book yet i'm sort of a year away and about 10 fights away from him finally hanging up his gloves at 17. um how much money did he have left at the end could did he could he move your you know your, your great great parents your great grandparents out to you know a nice house somewhere in the country um, he wasn't. He certainly wasn't set up for life. Uh, the, the wages in those days were were fairly low for pro sure. boxers. Although he was a top liner, so he was earning big money. But um, his career ended so quickly. Yeah. I think he was quite a, a sort of prudent saver. So uh, he put a lot of it away. Oh, good. Um, but he, he had to just return to a normal job. And, and I mean, he was a, a guy who left school at 14, as uh, sort of most working class people did in those days. Um, so he had nothing to fall back on after boxing, so it was a case of doing sort of jobs, labouring and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, he made, he made good money, but but not uh, enough to set him up for life or, or anything close to what 
I think he would have earned uh, ultimately if um, he'd been uh, allowed to reach his full potential. Now, th- th- I'm, I'm going to ask you about full potential in a moment, but I don't want you to give too much away about the book because I want people to, to go out and get it. Uh, I want people to go out and actually and actually buy a buy the thing. It's called Nipper, the amazing story of boxing's wonder boy by Alex Daly. And I'm speaking to Alex Daly now, who's the grandson of the great uh, Pat Nipper Daly. I'm, I'm going to ask you about this John, a fight against Johnny Cuthbert. It's uh, October 1929. I suppose I don't know. It's about fight uh, out of 120. It's probably about fight 100. Now it's the first time he actually questions the professor about money. Your granddad, by the way, who is what 16 at this time or something ridiculous in this fight? Yeah, 16. Yeah. And Cuthbert at that time was the British featherweight champion and a man of at least 24 or something crazy. I mean, it's just staggering. But he actually questions, if I'm not mistaken, he questions uh, the, the situation with with the money. Was that from that point on? Is it your understanding that that was a bit of an issue with them? Did, do you think maybe your grandfather was wising up in the last year or so of his career? Well, I think so, yeah. I know he was convinced that um, uh, they were sort of fiddling him from the money point of view. Um, but I don't think he ever really found out um, how much they were making. But he was told by various people in the boxing game that uh, uh, they were making money on the side that um, wasn't being declared. He wasn't getting his cut. Um, so not, not only was he uh, being overworked, but um, he, he wasn't receiving his full dues sort of thing. Now, um, I've got an email here from a guy in Sligo, Doug. He's a regular listener to the show, and he knew because I've been posting on various websites that I've, I was getting you on, and he's asked a question about the Battle in Battaliano fight that never happened because uh, the professor wouldn't let your grandfather go to America and make what would have been a record purse for him for only six rounds. What's your understanding of, of what happened there, and why, didn't, and why didn't the professor let him go, apart from obvious reasons, that he was his cash cow? Well, um, I think it, it does boil down to uh, precisely that. Um, if he, the, the contract he had him under was uh, a sort of handwritten contract. I think he signed it while he was a child. Um, and he was always a no, child. Even when he retired, he was still a child, that, Alex. That's the that's mad true, thing. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a, you know, a really young child. So yeah, baby, uh, yeah. I, I think he knew at the back of his mind that um, it wasn't legally enforceable, certainly not out in the States. and. Sure. Uh, probably knew about the reputations of some of the uh, sort of flash American managers and had it, probably had it in the back of his mind that if he allowed him to go out there, he'd uh, quickly lose him to uh, an American manager. So he has, he has all of these fights, 120 of these fights, 40 of them before he's 15 or something crazy like that. 15 rounders from the age of 13 or 14. And then by about 19, l- late 1930, Early 1931, when he has two two last fights in 31, he calls it a day at, at what, 17 years of age? 17 years of age, yeah. Without getting that elusive British title fight, because, wait for it, even though he was fighting guys that had won the British title, or would go on to win the British title, he was too young. That's right, yeah. He came very close to a British title shot, age just 15. Uh, he pretty much cleared up all the... Uh, Domestic competition. Uh, the title was then held by a Scot named uh, Johnny, Johnny Hill, Hill, who also, yeah, held a, a version of the world flyweight title. And a lot of the experts were saying he, he might well beat Hill, but uh, because he was a growing teenager, he outgrew the weight before he could even. Uh, then Hill died, the of course. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, he reached age 16. The uh, British Boxing Board of Control, which had uh, just come into force introduced the rule uh, saying they changed it later that you had to be 21 to fight for a British title so instantly his hopes were dashed oh it's quite staggering what so let, let's without going too much into why he stopped boxing what happened in the late 30s and the 40s when when your grandfather was still a man of only you know 27 31 32 what did he do how did he get a living well he, he did um, various sort of you uh, you know usual jobs, um, labouring, um, and but the whole time he was uh, he was training boxers, uh, but I don't suppose you could make uh, very much no. money from that in those days unless you had a, a sort of top-class fighter, sure. world-class fighter even. Um, so, so he, I mean, he did that pretty much most of his life. He trained boxers because uh, boxing was his biggest passion and uh, uh, something he never left. And he ended up he ended up with having a musical in Peckham and still but still training fighters that was through the 50s and into the 60s is that correct that's it yeah yeah obviously yeah he had a dance hall uh irish dance halls they were called they were all the rage at the time 
Uh, so he tried his hand at that in the 50s, uh, and that was uh, that turned out to be a bit of a mistake, but um, it, it, it was quite a lively time, I think. Oh. Have, have you considered trying to speak to the British Boxing Board of Control to see if we can get him some kind of posthumous Lonsdale belt, an honorary Lonsdale belt? Because in exceptional, and these are exceptional circumstances, here's a kid who was literally too good at 15 and 16 to fight for their title and couldn't get it because he was too good and then he was suddenly too young and too good, which is, seems like a, a joke in itself. Have you, have you considered speaking to the border control to, to get some kind of recognition? Uh, I haven't actually thought about that, but that, that's a yeah, great, that's idea. A great um, idea. It well, did occur to me. I'll back, um, you and I'll, it, I'll back you and I'll drive Robert Smith mad at the board about it. Yes, I will drive Robert Smith mad at the board about it. Now, the book is called, and it's a brilliant book, it's a, a sensational book. It's called Nipper, The Amazing Story of Boxing's Wonder Boy. And it's available, and this is the only way it's available, OK? You've got to go to this website, www.nipperpatdaily, and it's N-I-P-P-E-R-P-A-T-D-A-L-E-Y.co.uk. Or, if you're familiar with this show, you can just email me, Steve dot bunts at bbc.co.uk and I will give you the information. It's called Nipper, the amazing story of boxing's wonder boy and it's an amazing story. Now Doug in Sligo wanted to know about the Battagliano fight as I missed there. Well he's missed it because he's at hospital with his wife. He's okay though fellas, don't worry. But his wife is going to have a baby. <laughs>